Hey everybody, thank you for joining us at The Story today in our online community. Um, wherever you are today, you're part of the story and I'm grateful and honored to be with you. As many of you know, we've been pre-recording these services for the last few weeks as our teams are transitioning our worship from the gymnasium where we've been for a year into our brand new sanctuary where we had our grand opening last Sunday. And we are uh, hoping and working feverishly to make the live stream possible by as early as next Sunday. So this might be the last pre-recording that you'll see. And I can't wait for you to experience live worship again in the sanctuary with the rest of your story family. But until then, we'll make do with these pre-recorded uh, messages and services. And today's message is part seven in our series called Chosen Family. In this series, we are marching through the New Testament book called First Peter. And Simon Peter wrote it in the middle of the first century. And he wrote to inspire and encourage believers then, and to remind them of some of the ramifications and consequences of following Jesus. It's more than just a religious decision that changes your Sunday mornings. It really does change your whole life. And the consequence of following Jesus we're going to explore today might come as a little bit of a surprise, but it's this. Whenever you choose to give your life to Christ and follow him, you are enlisting in a war. You're becoming a, a soldier for a fight. And the reason that's surprising, I think, is that at least these days in our culture, where we're all pretty comfortable, you know, and, and it doesn't seem like we're hyper-persecuted or anything, we think about Christians as being the antithesis of soldiers, right? We think about good Christians being soft and sort of saccharine and, and sentimental in the way that, that we live our lives. Like, you know, we're just supposed to be the do-gooder types that uh, do the right thing. And, uh, and that's the end of it. But it's really hard to square that with what we find in, in the scriptures, where the Bible repeatedly uses militaristic terms to describe God, the kingdom of God, um, the people who are serving him in his kingdom. Like, it's, there's militaristic terms throughout. For example, as, as one instance, take, um, take the, the term uh, heavenly host, right? It's a phrase that appears a lot in the Bible, Old and New Testaments. When most people hear the phrase, the heavenly host, what do they think? They probably imagine a, a choir of beautiful angels dressed in white robes, singing in perfect harmony together, just sort of this beautiful, peaceful image. But the words in Hebrew and Greek that are translated as the heavenly host literally mean the army of heaven. So the heavenly host literally means the army of heaven. And so the angels repeatedly are cast in, in this light. I mean, they are, they are talked about in terms of being a, a battalion, a regiment. Um, uh, angels of darkness are called legion, which is another militaristic term. Angels have encampments in the Bible. They have marching orders. They have a chain of command. They have weapons. And so all of this militaristic sort of combat language is unavoidable when you read the scriptures. And, and it's not just the angels either. It's God himself, actually, in the book of Exodus and also in the prophet Jeremiah's book. Um, God is referred to as a warrior in no uncertain terms. And this is really interesting. In the prophet Isaiah's uh, 42nd chapter, verse 13, he prophesied about the coming Messiah. And this is what he said. He said, the Lord will march out like a mighty man, like a warrior. He will stir up his zeal. With a shout, he will raise the battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. There's another combat sort of uh, reference. And we think this is a reference to Jesus. Christians believe Isaiah is talking about Jesus here. And we, we understand his battle cry was when he cried out from the cross before he died. Three days later, he marched out like a, like a, what does it say, like a mighty man. He marched out of his tomb like a, like a warrior. He stirred up zeal among his followers, and, and he um, triumphed over his enemies. And so the image here isn't that Jesus came to sing Kumbaya with us. He came to win a war with us. I think we should take that seriously and really explore what that means. And throughout the New Testament, that theme continues with us as the followers of Jesus. We're called fellow soldiers. We're told to stay alert. We're told to be uh, on our guard. We're told to um, be prepared for the enemy's attacks. You know, all of these are military sorts of terms. We're told to hold our ground. 
put on the full armor of God. Like, I could go on and on. You get it? Like, we are called, in a sense, to battle and to be prepared to win the war we're in. Now, what does that mean exactly in real life? Well, first I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. It absolutely doesn't mean that we as Christians are supposed to be violent, you know, macho, kind of bullies and looking for a fight in the world every day. It certainly doesn't mean that we are fighting against people who don't see the world the way that we do, people who believe other things than what we believe, people of other faiths, and think that's not it at all. And, and anytime we get that you know, inclination, we need to reject that because that's not what we're talking about. Our battle is spiritual. Our enemy is evil. And the war we're waging is a, is a war on sin itself. And that starts with the sin in ourselves, right? The sin in our churches, and, and that's where the fight begins. Well, today's passage we're going to read from 1 Peter 4 lays out a battle plan. So God in his mercy gives us the way that we can follow and, and win this war. We're not left to our own um, defenses and devices. And so Peter's going to show us in today's reading three things that every Christian following Jesus needs in order to win this war and fight the good fight. 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, we'll read verses 1 through 5 to get started today. Peter wrote, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they don't live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what the pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge both the living and the dead. So the first thing that we need in order to fight a good fight and win this spiritual war we're in is to be armed with the attitude of Christ. Before we ever step out into battle, into this spiritual war, we should prepare ourselves beforehand to respond to the suffering we'll encounter in the world, to the estrangement, to the pain and disappointment, the loneliness that we will inevitably feel in a world that is often hostile to Christ and the things that Christ loves. You know, throughout his life on earth, Jesus suffered a lot. You know, he, he suffered at the hands of sinners. He suffered at the hands of his friends sometimes, especially toward the end of his life. But whenever he encountered these painful moments of, of his life, instead of allowing his pain to provoke him to sin and unrighteous anger, he just became more and more resolute to finish the job he came to do. He Instead of holding other people's wrongdoings against them, he leveraged those moments as opportunities to alleviate the suffering of other people, including the suffering of the people who were causing him to suffer. That's what it means to arm yourself with the attitude of Christ. Whenever life is hard, when things get tough, when you're hurting, when you're alone, um, to to be prepared for those battles by having the same attitude that Christ had when he suffered. Now, the takeaway for us is, I think the, the more closely you follow Jesus, the more deeply you fall in love with Jesus, the more likely it will be that this world will not love you back for doing that. Now, I think a lot of people seem to believe the more I become like Jesus, the more the world will like me because the world seems to kind of like Jesus. And that might be true in some corners of the world, or on some surface level. But generally speaking, the more seriously you take your faith, the more devoted and loving you are to Jesus and close you are to him, the, the more difficult life will be at times in the world and the more social estrangement and suffering and pain you will be subjected to. Um, this is often the case with people who are the closest to you, unfortunately. <laughs> For a lot of believers, especially new believers, you face this struggle that the people that knew the old you want the old you back, right? They, they want you to do the things you used to do, 
And if you don't, they'll find your newfound faith in Christ annoying at best, if not threatening to what they want to do, the way they want to live. So the, party, the, the people you used to party with, the people you used to drink with, hang with, maybe even sleep with, they will want you to go back to doing the things you used to do. And that's why Peter wrote, you know, they are surprised, as if to say, they, they are surprised now that you don't continue to join them like you used to in the reckless, wild living, and then they'll heap abuse on you. And that abuse is, that's a, that's a, that's a word that can mean a lot of things and, and it takes a lot of forms. But I think a lot of times what it means is just being isolated, feeling alone. I've known a lot of people over the years who've come to faith in Christ and they've given their life to him, only to have their oldest and closest friends and family members at times who aren't believers or aren't on board with Jesus, absolutely turn on them. You know, they, they stop getting invited to the things they used to get invited to. They no longer get invited to the parties. They no longer get invited to, you know, the girls' night out. Or they no longer get invited to poker nights or to the weekends in Vegas. And just to be clear, from a pastor's point of view, that's a win, right? That's not necessarily a bad thing that you're not getting invited to those things anymore. But, but, but that aside, that doesn't take the pain away, does it? It still hurts. It hurts to be excluded from things. It hurts to feel alone, ever. I mean, it's one of our greatest fears as human beings. It hurts to be left out and cut off by the people who used to be your inner circle. And I've seen this happen to all kinds of Christians. It's not just one group of us. Like, men get cut out of things after they're coming to Christ. Women get cut out of things after they're coming to Christ. I've seen young people, teenagers, who make the courageous decision in their youth to turn their lives around and give themselves to Jesus and then their circles of friends will either sort of tacitly, you know, covertly or overtly, openly reject them or, um, or exclude them from that group. And that's a kind of real suffering. It's, it's so real, in fact, that I've also witnessed people, especially new believers, go into that battle unprepared, unarmed with the attitude of Christ. And then when they face that battle, they succumb to it and they end up going back to doing the things they used to do. And that's always heartbreaking to see. But to arm yourself with the attitude of Christ means letting your pain and suffering, whatever forms they take, prepare you for the battle ahead. Take loneliness, for example. We've talked about that a little already because that's a universal experience. Loneliness is pain. But no one who's ever walked this earth has been lonelier than Jesus was toward the end of his life on earth. Jesus was abandoned and estranged by his closest friends who he thought had his back, who said they had his back. They literally left him hanging in his hour of need, on his darkest day. They left him alone. But even though he was abandoned, Jesus refused to abandon his post until his mission was accomplished on earth. You see, this is how God works with our pain God really is so good that he can take the hardest things you've ever been through, and the darkest days you've ever known, and redeem them and turn them around for your benefit and for his kingdom's sake. <laughs> I have a front row seat to some of this that I know I'm privileged as a pastor to have, but I have literally heard so many people over the years Talk about, these are Christians now, talk about the worst things they've ever gone through in this life and talk about how in retrospect, they'll say it's, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. L literally twice this week, I heard two different men say that very same thing. One young man said, you know, I used to have this job that I loved, but it was bad for me. It was bad company, and I got a lot of bad habits out of it, but the money was good, and I loved a lot about, you know, that job. But getting fired from that job, the day I got fired, it's the best thing that ever happened to me in retrospect. It didn't feel that way then, but he sees it now. Another man this week told me that getting caught in the affair that he was having, best thing that ever happened to him. Even though it didn't feel good then, he sees it. Now, I've heard other guys over the years say things like, yeah, getting diagnosed with cancer, having cancer, in retrospect, best thing that ever happened to me. And on the surface, and you hear things like this, and you're like, that's crazy. How could that, how could that possibly be true? But when you hear this same narrative from independent sources, 
you have to be willing to ask the question, what if there's more going on here? What if it's really true? What if God really can take something that seems like a loss and make it a win? What if he can take the things that hurt like hell to get us into heaven, you know, and use them for those purposes? What if he can turn something that feels like it's the end and make it a new beginning for you? That's what he does. God uses our suffering and pain as a, a reason to, for, for us to be done with sin. When you go through these seasons and let God show you what he can do, you will see what Peter meant when he said, you are done with sin now, that's not who you are anymore. That's fundamentally what it means to be armed with the attitude of Christ. And that's the first thing we need to win this war. The second is a little shorter, it's simpler. It's verse 7 of uh, this same chapter 4, where Peter said, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. So the second thing we need in order to win this war we're in is to be, be alert, stay alert in prayer. Christians should always be on high alert and sober-minded. Why? So that we can pray with an appropriate sense of urgency because the end is near. That's what Peter says and the Bible says this repeatedly. Now, this raises some memories and maybe some concerns for me. I grew up in a time in uh, American Christianity when Christians were hyper-focused on the end times. I felt like that's all I ever heard about at church was the end times and all these things related to the end times. Part of that's because the Left Behind series was dropping in the, in the late 90s and the, the books were um, selling like crazy. Y2K was looming. People were worried about Y2K. My preacher growing up was convinced that Saddam Hussein was the Antichrist. We heard a lot about it. Terrorist attacks were on the rise in America. I felt like we were on 24-7 rapture watch when I was a teenager. And teenagers today, kids today, will never know the horror of, of walking home into an empty house before the days of cell phones and, and Life360 apps when we could track our family's whereabouts you were only left to assume that they'd been raptured and you'd been left behind, probably because of the way you looked at that cute girl at school that day. And that fear, as silly as it sounds, back then that fear was real. And I don't want us to go back to that, mainly because we don't have anything to be afraid of as Christians. We didn't, need not be afraid or, or anxious about the end times, right? So the point Peter's making is that nobody knows when the end will come. I mean, logic tells us that every passing day brings us closer to the end than anyone's ever been before, but we still don't need to be anxious because no one knows the day or the hour. At the same time, the reverse effect can happen where we never think about the end because, you know, we don't want to go back to, you know, the, those days I described earlier, and we lose our sense of urgency. And I think that's what's happening in the church today, in America at least. We're, we're losing our sense of urgency, and it's, it's uh, really exposed by how we pray. When we don't think our days are numbered, when we don't think about the end, our prayers become soft. And, and we pray like we've got all the time in the world. We pray, for example, whenever we can find the time to pray, which is rarely because we're all so busy. We pray when we get around to it. Not very often, right? And whenever we do get around to praying, we we often pray like a, a kid making their Christmas list, you know, like God, Santa Claus, and we're like, Lord, if you would just give me this, or I really want that, or if you would do this for me, Lord, I promise I'll be a good boy next year. But prayer isn't the stuff of Christmas lists and fairy tales. Prayer, according to the Bible, is war. Prayer is warfare. Now, I know we're all sort of used to praying with our heads down and eyes closed and hands folded, and that's a, that's a, a perfectly natural position to take, a, a posture to have when you're pray, praying. It's, it's humble, it's, it's serene, it's good. But Peter says sometimes what we need to do is pray with our eyes wide open. Pray like a warrior would pray in battle. The Apostle Paul said the same thing, by the way, in Colossians Chapter 4, verse 2, he wrote, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful as you pray. Why should we be watchful as we pray? Because 
Friends, this isn't the best thing you might want to hear today, but our days are numbered. Whether it's because Jesus is going to come back today or tomorrow or because we're all just one accident or one heartbeat away from breathing our last breath of life on this earth, no one knows how much time we have left. And so it begs the question, if you knew that today could be your last on this earth, how would it change the way you pray? I know I, I would, I'd like to think I would pray differently if I had that sense of urgency. I would pray more passionately for my children to cling to the Lord and to always trust Him. I'd pray for my wife to, to be okay and trust the Lord in every circumstance. I'd pray for you, my church, to hold fast to the truth of God and the gospel of Jesus, even as the world, you know, devolves and, into whatever the world does and the winds of change blow in the culture around you and you feel the pressure to change with them. Don't change. Hold fast. Be true to the truth and trust in the Lord. I'd also pray for my friends who I love, who I, I'm ashamed to say I rarely pray for them by name. My friends I love who are lost. I'd pray that they might be found in Christ by some miracle of grace. I'd pray with my eyes wide open and with a great sense of urgency if I knew today could be my last. What if we all prayed that way every day as though it's potentially our last day on earth? Well, that's what it would look like for us to be and, and to stay sober and alert in prayer. And that's how we pray to win this war. There's one more thing that we need in addition to arming ourselves with the attitude of Christ and being alert in our prayer. And Peter talks about it in verses 8 through 11. So if uh, you want to read with me, verses 8 through 11 of 1 Peter 4. He says, Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms, in its various forms. So the grace is uh, the, the mechanism through which the gift comes, right? So the, everybody's given these gifts to serve. Verse 11, if anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. The third thing we need to do as followers of Jesus to win the war we're in is to be available to serve. We need to be available to serve. That's a little easier said than done, right? Um, if following Jesus means that we're enlisting in a war, then that should change the way that we think about the church, I think. Like a lot of secular organizations, even, the church tends to, most churches tend to um, operate under this unspoken 80-20 rule. You know the rule where 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people? Now, I think that's because most of us tend to think about the church not as a battalion we're enlisting in, but as an organization or an institution that is here to serve us. And, you know, the few people that do the work, we're grateful for them, but that's their job and we should let them do it. Um, and so we show up to attend, you know, once in a while or weekly, maybe. We show up, we take it all in. The, the, the singing, the songs, the sermon, you know, um, a donut or two, maybe, a little, little coffee, perhaps. We take it all in and then we go home. Well, imagine enlisting in an army that way. <laughs> imagine enlisting in the army and showing up for basic training. And then you find the drill sergeant and you ask him where he keeps the donuts. And when he inevitably shouts you down and calls you a, a maggot and tells you to get to work, uh, you let him know that uh, you're here to take it all in today. You know, you're, you're here not to do the training, but to watch others train. You're here to sort of enjoy the experience and to attend the training. Well, I doubt he'll give you a donut, as uh, anyone who's in, been through basic training would tell you. That's probably unlikely. What he would tell you is to get to work because everybody's got a job to do in the army or in any military, um, uh, in any military branch. Everybody's got a job to do. Some soldiers, 
strategize in a command center. Some soldiers parachute out of, out of airplanes. You know, some soldiers serve meals in the mess hall or serve as medics in the hospital. Some fight on the front lines. Some fight from behind a computer monitor. Whatever the case, everybody has a job to do. And more importantly, every job must be done. Every job matters to the whole group. And so it is with the Church of Jesus Christ. Whether you're a lifelong Christian, you've always been in church, or you're a brand new believer, the point is we're in this war together, and we need each other to do the job we're called and equipped to do. Now, Peter says there's one job we're all called to, and that's the job of loving each other deeply. And it's sort of the job from which all the other jobs flow. To, to love each other deeply is the first way that we work together to win this fight. He says, above all, love each other deeply, for love covers over a multitude of sins. Now, that doesn't mean we, we ignore each other's sins. It doesn't mean sin doesn't matter when we love each other. It doesn't mean we cover up each other's sins. That's not what he says. All right? What he's saying here is that we're in a war. Sin is deadly. Our enemy is looking to exploit our sins and the sins that other people commit against us to distract us from the fight and to take us out of it. And as good soldiers who love one another, we cover each other's backs because we love each other. We cover each other's backs so that the enemy and our sins can't have their way with us. And so we cover each other in love. Now, beyond the job of loving each other deeply, Peter explores some other more specific jobs that different Christians are equipped to do in the church, and each of them is important. First, Peter, he identifies three specific ones. I mean, he talks about hospitality and how important it is to be hospitable without grumbling. We have wonderful hospitality people here at the story, and some of them are already serving. Some of you need to get to work because that's your gifting. And hospitality matters. It makes the church a warm and inviting place where new believers or skeptics can come and find community. Hospitality is, is it's supernatural. It's powerful. And so are acts of service. He talks about uh, the, the gift of service, which is another spiritual gift. It's like the, the person who will serve you. If it makes you happy, they'll do it no matter what. You know, they'll get on their knees and clean the toilet or they'll make the coffee or they'll show up early or they'll stay late. Like that's service mentality. That's a spiritual gift. And some of you have it. Whether you're using it or not or employing it or not, you have that gift. And so is speaking. He talks about speaking. And that's sort of the gift of, of teaching and encouraging, training and preaching for others. And there's other gifts in the New Testament, it's gifts of the Spirit. Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 are great places to go if you're looking for more exhaustive lists of some of the gifts of the Spirit and the jobs and tasks the Lord assigns believers to do in His army. Things like administration. Some of you have that gift. Uh, God bless you. It's never been one that I felt extraordinarily gifted in. But we need people who are if we're going to be the army of Christ that he's called us to be. Others have the gift of evangelism. Others are called to be generous and be extraordinarily generous with uh, financial means or with their time. Others are, are, are called into the department of healing within God's army. And, and that's a real gift that uh, we see the fruits of all the time in the church. There's preaching, there's a department of faith. There's, if some, some people are just given the gift of faith and that's your job, is to be a person of such extraordinary faith that when others get discouraged, you're there as a beacon, a reminder of the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. And there's other jobs that are listed in those chapters, Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 as well. And the point is that it is not that these jobs just exist and they've got to be done. The point is that the Holy Spirit faithfully equips us, all of us, every believer is given gifts from the Holy Spirit that allow us to do a good job for the Lord. So if you're a part of that 80% in our church or whatever church you call home, if, if the story's not your home, that 80% who attend but don't yet serve or work, I'm not here to judge you, all right? I'm not here to harass you or coerce you into doing something. Um, and don't worry, like the donuts aren't going anywhere. We'll keep those around because, you know, again, hospitality matters. <laughs> I just want you to know there's more. There's more waiting for you. And it will be exciting and life-giving when you discover it. There's a job with your name on it. 
And all it takes is seeking the wisdom of God, going straight to him in prayer, or talking to other trusted Christians about the gifts they see evident in your life, the ways the Holy Spirit's equipping you to do a job. And then once you know where God has gifted you and what he's calling you to do, all that's left is for you to declare yourself and make yourself available to God to serve him and his church, and, and he will, and it will bring you life, and it will bring the church uh, further toward um, you know, the, the goal of being the church we're called to be together. So the, the big picture in 1 Peter 4 is that we, together, are in a real war. There are real consequences in this spiritual war, and it is a war that's worth fighting as we fight on behalf of one another, on behalf of our church, on behalf of our families, our homes, and our friends, brothers and sisters in Christ. There's a lot at stake in this war. Our enemy is always on the attack. Our enemy wants nothing more than to distract and discourage us from fighting back. But even then, we have nothing to fear because he who is for us is greater than he who is against us. And all we have to do as believers and followers of Jesus is arm ourselves with the attitude of Christ to always stay alert and pray like it's our last day on this earth and to make ourselves available to the Lord, to his church, and to the world as we serve and work together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this teaching from 1 Peter. Thank you for using your servant Peter to be an evangelist and a preacher and teacher to the church, encouraging believers in the middle of the first century to keep going, and by some miracle, encouraging us 2,000 years later to do the same. Lord, I pray for our church, your church throughout the world, that every believer and follower of Jesus in your church would respond to this call, not just to attend an institution or to support an organization, but to enlist for this fight by arming ourselves with Christ's attitude about suffering and pain, by staying alert and sober-minded and praying with urgency, Lord, and by making ourselves available to be your servant and the servant of our brothers and sisters in the world around us. We love you and we thank you for this reminder today. And we pray in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.